Hello everyone, today we talk about Visigothic kings and Catholic populations in 5th century Aquitaine. Um, this is a chapter we never quite addressed. We talked about the Visigoths, uh, we talked about even the councils of Toledo, so looking actually at the religious policy of the Visigothic kingdom. Uh, we have talked about late antique Gaul in general and the transition to the, what we call the, the early Middle Ages in, in the region. Uh, but we rarely talked specifically about Aquitaine and this space that has really a great importance throughout all ancient uh, history um, and for, for the Roman Empire and also eventually for, for the Middle Ages as well. Essentially, you know that as uh, Caesar began to describe uh, the Gaul um, as such, actually he said, you know, it's split in three parts and properly one is Aquitaine, one, another one is Gaul proper, the other one is the the Belgica, or how they, they called it at the time. Um, meaning what, actually? Meaning that Aquitaine, since ancient times, had objectively been um, a sort of um, of country on its own. We can put it in this way, a nazio on its own, if we had to express it in the properly ancient Latin um, term and its etymology. Uh, meaning that it was effectively not a Celtic, a Celtic, if you prefer, land uh, as such. It was populated by uh, other tribes, other groups that in part were pre-Indo-European, other came from essentially north um, western Iberian Peninsula and it retained for a long time, it still does ideally, right, this continuity with, which is different from um, that definitely shares a lot with it, with its neighbors but also has maintained its own uniqueness. This is much more evident I would say in high medieval, uh, low medieval times where there is the, the struggle of the French monarchy to, to absorb the, the, the southern uh, how, what do you say that here? Gallic or French at that point? Because it hadn't, that transition hadn't quite uh, happened yet. That had effectively a, a great um, legacy, a cultural legacy on their own. As you know, they were pretty advanced, they were uh, solidly urbanized, and this is also what we will discuss today, because it was a very important strategic asset for, for the Romans and for, for the Visigoths that eventually settled in there. Um, and that shared different different language, for example, right? The Languedoc was effectively uh, different from uh, the the French tongue of the north, um, and um, it, it was a different society uh, in many ways. And eventually, these lands had uh, a further um, separation from the French crown because, of, in fact, of the uh, the Aquitanian uh, legacy in, 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 for, for the English kingdom that held these territories together with Normandy for, for a very long time, up to effectively up, up, up to the uh, mid-15th century. So it was an area that preserved, like others, and this can be observed not just in Gaul, but also in the Iberian Peninsula, uh, as such, its own solid uh, identitary character. The reason I think that I have you know, inquired a little bit just out of curiosity back in the day when I studied um, ancient history late antiquity on whether what, what that there is this um, let's say cliche that we used to say well Aquitaine was so different because after all it was deeply Romanized now this is in part true right and uh, this part has actually a geographical dimension because the trick that sometimes happens to the people that, that read especially late antique history in this moment specifically is that they consider Aquitaine as such um, essentially as uh, the uh, what was at the time the Diocletian um, province proper so this big region actually that encom encompassed both the Mediterranean and the Atlantic watersheds um, that was not properly the historical Aquitaine. I mean, historical Aquitaine is properly the Atlantic watershed, the, the Garonne Valley, right, with Bordigola, today's Bordeaux, um, and so this land, basically, um, this Atlantic region comprehended between the Pyrenees and, and the Loire River. This is pretty big, right? Um, and uh, Diocletian had, as you know, reorganized the, the Roman administration, and under the name of Aquitaine came to fall actually other lands that had not been mm, historically actually 
you know, culturally completely part of the Aquitanian people as such, and that had actually very different levels of development. And arguably the most important of this was definitely what before was known as the Gallia Narbonensis, that is, this stripe of, uh, I mean, it's essentially the, 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 the Mediterranean watershed of today's um, southwestern France, Languedoc, Roussillon, the, those regions, um, that was in, instead massively Romanized, differently, I would say, from Aquitaine, right? And you say this, it sounds like an heresy, you say, oh, Aquitaine was renowningly Romanized, a uh, place is such, such deep and strong a Roman continuity, yes, but mostly, actually, in this southern part of it, from the Mediterranean side, from these uh, places like Narbonne, Toulouse, that were you know, something different from the wide Atlantic plains uh, that stretched in, in the northwest from there, right? Um, and and therefore, we, we get this impression that uh, Aquitaine is such, this, the actual historical region was so deeply developed and Romanized, but as a matter of fact, it was an area that was, we can say, of, m- m- of average Romanization, right? Very different from the Narbonensis that was instead massively, and I mean massively and deeply at the root Romanized. Um, after, you know, century... It, it, of course, even Narbonensis is not um, sent for sent Roman, there were other traditions, including, for example, the Hellenic one on the coast, and still the, you know, the, the partly Celtic, part other, even in Bavarian, um influences and other local, um, uh, properly local, uh, uh, indigenous elements, if you want. But this is not the point. The point is realizing the, the composition of this area. Another part that is... Instead, more attached to Aquitaine proper, but it's still something else in many ways. Also, just from an environmental point of view, which is pretty evident, is Auvergne, right? So, in the very center of, um, say, south center of France, right? In this region that doesn't doesn't uh, border the, the the waters of the Mediterranean, is is a continental region. We can rightfully claim so, and that also historically developed as, in, in part, is still very often attached to Aquitaine in, in its fate, and partly also to the southern lands of the Narbonensis, um, but that that was also another chunk on its own, was also closer to uh, the lands occupied by the the Burgundians in the Lug, Lugdinensis, etc. So I, I care about having this picture clear in mind, because it's important to see um, even here, how and, and, and why uh, a certain expansion uh, from the side of, of the Goths, eventually of the Franks, etc., took certain directions, what were the pre-existent bases and roots of this, and um, effectively why it was important to control this land. What were also the limits to, in terms of stretching uh, these territorial dominations to, to, to sort of limit? Um, so, What's the deal here? Well, the deal is that um, when you look at the 5th century, you have effectively the Visigothic settlement in Aquitaine. So this happens, just to, to look at the story a little bit, in this pretty tumultuous time for, for, for Gaul, or better, the Gauls as such, um, which is the beginning of, like, after, uh, say, starting from 407, right, 409, eventually 410 properly, when Gaul was invested by this massive wave of Germanic populations, um, Germanian, Germanic and, say, also Iranic in some, some cases, the Vandals, um, the, the, the Alans, for example, the Suebi, right, they, those had crossed the frozen Rhine and swept across modern-day France and, and reached even the Iberian Peninsula. That were provinces of the Roman Empire at the time that overall were surely deeply, deeply Romanized, so much, in fact, that they still speak Romance languages today, which originally, before the Roman conquest, um, they didn't. They were actually rich uh, places at the time, especially Gaul was, by the 5th century, essentially the, 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 the surely the richest, in absolute terms, province of the West, um, in terms of sheer quantity, uh, especially of agricultural resources, which at the time were really a big deal, right, especially after the demographic contractions and the economic crisis in general of the time. These huge Atlantic plains that um, uh, definitely represented, from a territorial 
point of view a very interesting option for many peoples that now were coming straight out of continental Europe, of Eastern Europe, that had never seen the levels of development and um, you know and, and, and wealth of these uh, of this European and Mediterranean um, regions. Um, so you know the story we talked a lot about the Franks, how this happened theoretically. The Franks were there in the frontier for the Romans in the northeast, in in, in, in the in the Belgian Gaul, uh, to to stop theoretically this wave. But after the sea, the, the resistance collapsed. Actually, they tried to stand; they were defeated. Um, they they keep expanding uh, in the north, and therefore they become to to encompass this area that is uh, in fact bordered by the in the west by the Loire River, so actually bordering Aquitaine proper, but by this time still not crossing, right? That would happen at the beginning of the 6th century, as we will see. Um, and um, so the one of the major uh, peoples now that were, however, on the march, as we've seen in that video we made a couple of months ago about the Visigoths in general, were in fact the Visigoths <laughs> under Alaric, that actually had died in, uh, in as we know, in, in southern Italy after having sacked Rome, and that now um, were were essentially heading towards towards Gaul, right? Because they were seeing at that point it was was, was a fair area to live. It was fairly, let's say, decentralized. Um, a big problem for these peoples now was settling in areas that could be rich enough to sustain themselves and to give them the, the military capability the, in terms of supplies and you know, logistics to keep in check um, part of, of Roman movements, but at the same time kind of being close enough to, to, you know, to Roman power so that they could essentially share part of it. The Visigoths are legitimately um, credited as the most Romanized um, uh, Ger Germanic people, um, especially at this time, because they were essentially the ones that entered, uh, you know, straight away in contact with, the, right, they crossed, they crossed the Danube, they, as we know, that they did what they did in, in Trace, um, in the Balkans, they actually paid a very high tribute of blood for Rome, they fought pretty well in suffering massive losses, that, that also what it had brought them eventually, since they had not been adequately rewarded, in part, then it's obviously a political game, you know, there is no bad or, or, or good guy in, in, in this history. Um, they had marched on, uh, marched on Rome, which they looted in a fairly, uh, you know, m moderate way, especially in, in terms of violence, given the, those time standards, and now they, they decided to take um, a, a firm, like, to, to get what they thought they actually been fighting for, right? The, the Romans had been also pretty nasty towards them. They had carried out slaughters, even civilians. They, they, there was a, you know, uh, there was a real problem. Visigoths realized that their future was ensured at that point if they could carve their own space, even with, partly with the compliance of Rome itself, um, in, in the West. That was fairly uh, and exposed to the major waves, especially those of the nomadic peoples, see uh, the Huns at this point from which the same Visigoths had fled, um, <coughs> excuse me, and that could, um, as we've seen, give them a, a future as a people. I'll always believe, think in, in this context that yeah, these peoples were surely ruthless, just as much as the Romans were, but at the same time, they, they weren't faring very well on their own, right? It's not that Rome was one day, um, like, uh, whistling and, and sleeping on its uh, achievements, and then these terrible guys arrived to destroy everything, because they were so strong compared to them. No, actually, they were pretty weak, and they were perfectly aware of that. I mean, they had, they realized, essentially, in just in a few tens of thousands of armed men, which uh, meant essentially one-third of their entire population, um, and uh, just a single battle could wipe them out. Visigoths had, as we have seen, already been depleted in part by the various um, wars that they had taken part in, and they legitimately cared, you know, not to end 
up uh, annihilated as they had risk to to do in several on several occasion uh, the, the history of Alaric in Stilicho I mean it's pretty evident basically the Romans um, could wipe out literally uh, the entire population two or three times and they simply didn't do that because they they needed uh, the Visigoths as a as a pawn on their on their chessboard, um, but they um, because demographic resources were quite important. So these men were uh, these people, let's say better, were in their military element quite quite important for the same strategic balance of the empire. And as we know, in fact, quite famously, as we will see now, uh, the allegiances shifted. Right, the, the Visigoths fought against the Romans for the Romans, depending on, on the situation, just as like the Franks, uh, as the Burgundians, right, and all the so-called federati that served um, the empire um, at the time. Um, and Atalf, king of the Visigoths from 410 to 415, so after the death of Alaric, spent the next few years operating in the Gallic and his, uh, in Hispanic countryside. Right, and um, he was quite clever because he managed to exploit the divisions between the Germanic and Roman um, commanders. Let's put it in this way, because it's really a military matter at this point. Like peoples are really looking at each other now, based on their on their effective military strength in, in demographic terms, chiefly because they uh, they're pretty much the same thing, also from a military point of view. Or almost right, but um, there is a pretty pretty low asymmetry uh, at this point. Yeah, objectively, Rome has the, the best military still, uh, but especially in the West, um, the the gaps being uh, quickly filled, and it's all technically a matter of resources. But uh, as we have seen, that the Visigoths themselves were, you know, largely Romanized, and it was not just even a matter of. Um, you know, of of having coming within the imperial borders. I mean, the Germanic populations had lived uh, next door to, to to the empire for for centuries and centuries, and they had been uh, intensely Romanized in this regard, and especially from a military point of view. Also, because these were people that, since the very early times, they, as soon as they met Rome, they had constantly um, served in in the Roman military. Constantly, right? This is not something that happens in the late Roman Empire. It, it happened literally as soon as the, the they met the Romans. Um, uh, maybe not with the Teutonics, but uh, in the Teutonic migrations. But since uh, the Gallic invasion of, um, of Caesar, this had become the standard. Um, and uh, so they had chiefly at this point like a, a center of power, the, the, the Visigoths identify, in fact, uh, southern Aquitaine proper, as this area, like Aquitaine in general, but chiefly this very wealthy city of uh, cities of the south, such as Narbonne and Toulouse that were, were captured in f 413, so much that actually the first, um, I mean, nucleus of, of the Visigothic kingdom was known as the kingdom of Toulouse, right? Eventually, the, the capital was shifted to Toledo in, in, in the central uh, Iberian plateau. Um, but uh, at this point, in fact, the Visigothic center was here. And they had already, as we've seen, actually looked at Spain, which was also a pretty good a province to, in, in, let's say, Spain had some differences in the, the overwhelmingly rich and uh, developed uh, area of Spain was the, the very south, what the Romans called the Baetica, and uh, the center nor uh, the center of Spain was fine. It was decently Romanized. It was a bit like Aquitaine, if we had to make comparisons. The north of Spain wasn't uh, almost at all, just like mm, Bretagne, Armorica. I mean, in the north west of Gaul, um, and so there were these various shades of, and, and the general idea is that the Romans, of course, wanted to, to as would be evident even in later uh, centuries, even with the Justinian reconquest, actually to seize exactly these ultra-rich and ultra-Romanized areas, and leaving the outskirts of it to the uh, to these other populations that were variously um, associated with Rome at the end of the day. They were, they were still part of a, of a broader commonwealth. Even naturally, the Germanic kings wanted to, to, to stress their own um, independence, but they, they still perfectly understood the 
advantages uh, and the benefits of being, um, you know, still partly uh, delegated in their role by Rome. Also because they could legitimately um, claim to be the, uh, the, the direct, uh, maybe not direct, but the continuators of, of Roman legacy in terms of government and power, uh, I, and even and especially under a sacral point of view. This is why today we talk about religion. Um, so there are several uh, events here, like there, there are all the, the events of uh, concerning Bill Gala Placidia, all these uh, factors here. Um, we can, however, look at 418, where Honorius, a Western Emperor, rewarded uh, the Visigothic federates under King Balia that had followed Atalf reigning from 1415 to 1419 by giving them, the Visigoths, land in the Garonne Valley, right, of the so-called Gallia Aquitania, right, on which to settle, right. Um, so this kind of makes sense because that's an area that can't sustain the Visigothic population, um, it's an area that, as we have seen, is Romanized, so it works um, still, right? The goal maintains is probably the, the country uh, in the West that, in absolute terms, maintained more continuity with the Roman forms of administration um, in on the long run, uh, at, at the thresholds of the early modern, uh, excuse me, of the early Middle Ages. Um, and uh, we don't know much about the settlement, but it was probably uh, t taking place under the, the same conditions of the so-called hospitalitas, which basically consisted of the um, Roman um, acceptance of the of granting usually one third uh, portion of the local land, right, or the of of the of of the actually of the tax collection um, to the federati as such, which means that uh, actually the uh, the local politics and society, yes of course, well it's controlled militarily by the Germans, but it still fo uh, works because of Roman administration, right? And there is all a process of naturally of acquaintance of the Germanic elites with the local uh, Galdo Romans in this case. Um, and uh, it seems likely that at first the Visigoths were not given a large amount of land proper, right, land estates in the region, as previously believed, but that they acquired the taxes of the region, right, with the local Gallic aristocrats now paying their taxes to the Visigoths instead of to the Roman government. This makes sense because objectively uh, the Visigoths I in that situation, especially as soon as they arrived in you know, in, in Gaul, they, they didn't quite have many plans to, you know, they didn't know what 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 was what would happen next, right? You you can't really do it, um, uh, in, especially at this point where the, the world political picture was um, oh, background was all pretty unstable, right? All these peoples wandering around, not really w knowing what would happen in a few years, right? Um, but it, it's still important because it also shows that the, uh, the Visigoths wanted to cooperate not just with imperial authority but also with the local populations, right? It didn't happen always in the same way, right? There, are, there were peoples that, especially in Spain, beha behaved in a much wilder fashion. The Vandals, for example, but th that was um, because effectively they knew they wouldn't, they wouldn't stay long. Um, there. And in fact, when they get to Africa, they actually do a pretty good job, contrarily to what is commonly believed that the Vandals were somewhat so bad and so so evil and destructive and intolerant. Well, no, that's mostly um, legitimate papal propaganda that, you, if you understand from a political point of view, actually was pretty damned clever. Here, the church is really amazing in terms of intelligence, it's strepitous, but uh, it's still, you know, propaganda, as it was every political, you know, conception of the time, so, um, but it's a shame you still believe these things, I, I, even in the face of evidence of, of pretty good accomplishments of Vandalic Africa, after all, talking even about a Vandalic Renaissance at some point. Um, um, so, the Visigoths, now, you don't have to think that all of this was pacific, right? The, the thing was actually pretty 
tense in, in general because the the local Gallo Roman aristocrats weren't happy at all of 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 this presence, but you know still better than nothing, especially in moments in which um the the areas could remain really uh, out on their own like Gaul had showed since the previous centuries this kind of autonomistic tendencies from 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 Italy but from the, the the center of imperial power there had been some usurpers as well that had started from the Gauls as um, building kind of their own domination not even in a competitive sense with the, with the empire but simply you know they were there they were in Gaul right the Dries um, you you have always to think that the Roman Empire went on as uh, uh, effectively different countries put together all the time. Like there was not a an homogeneous Romanity or a local uh, flat identity. No, the, the were, these were big areas. Think about what the were communications of the times. That yes, in Roman times were quite advanced, quite um, also well kept, uh, etc. Think about the roads and so on. But still, you know certain systems for even in geographical reasons are tend to stay you know a bit on their own um and and that's the reason why uh, this aristocracy had so the the, the 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 visigothic presence also as you know a factor of stabilization and with when they could also cooperate but there had been warfare here i mean these the, the cities had been stormed there had been sieges effectively so um it wasn't um, it wasn't that easy. Uh, al- al- always given that there was still a Roman presence there, even from a military point of view. I mean, there were Roman garrisons. There was the Roman military system still standing, you know, even if in a decentralized fashion, etc., with a sporadic presence of, of you know, the actual mobile army. Uh, but locally speaking, it was full of of communities that still uh, had their allegiance with with Rome, and they would m- maintain that for for quite of a long of a long time, right? Even you know, well there is no need to make examples, but I think you get what I mean. Uh, the so mm, the Visigoths with their capital at Toulouse, right, remained uh, for this reason, however, progressively ever more autonomous when not de facto independent, right? And and so, soon also began to expand uh, into Roman territory at the expense of the feeble Western Empire. Under Theodoric I, 418, 451, the Visigoths attacked Arles um, in 425, um, uh, in 430, uh, Narbonne in 436. They were checked at one point by Flavius Etius, who used eunuch uh, Hunnic mercenaries ag- against the Visigoths, um, and Theodoric was in fact defeated by the Romans 438. But by 451, the situation had reversed as the Huns had invaded Gaul, and now Theodoric fought fam- famously under Etius himself against Attila the Hun at the Battle of the Catalonian Plains, right? even meeting the, the Ostrogoths from the other side. Um, in battle. Now, as we know, Attila was driven back. Theodoric was killed in battle, right? Um, th- this is important because at that point, uh, th- this example shows pretty well what what the deal was, right? You know, th- this guy is always trying to 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 maintain a certain degree of autonomy that Rome always, uh, still at this point, thought was capable of essentially curbing, right? And Majorianus' expedition in Spain was actually pretty meaningful from this point of view. Like the Visigoths were almost, um, they were bas- they basically surrendered to Rome. If it hadn't been because of the Vandalic intervention, the actually the, the it's possible that the Western Roman Empire would have lived on easily, right? That w- there was nothing uh, teleological. Or uh, um, you know uh, deterministic about the fall of the Western Roman Empire, not at all, right? Even if people like to to tell it in this way, if you just look at the events, no, then it's not also how the systems work. You know, if there is enough stability, if you control enough territories and resources, you can do that, right? History could have taken easily uh, another path, um, and the 
the Vandals, by the way, completed the conquest of North Africa, as we were saying before, they took Carthage on October the 19th, 439. The Suebi um, had taken most of Spain at the time, um, and, and those were some of the major, in fact, competitors for, for, for the Visigoths, and that even when uh, you know the, the Visigoths shifted the center of their kingdom in Spain proper. The, the Suebi, yes, they were defeated at some point, but and they, they diluted eventually. But they always remained in this geographical area of essentially northern Portugal, northwestern Spain, as this um, you know difficult population to subdue, like the outskirts, generally speaking, northern Spain, but also the Ebro Valley. Um, from from the center southern area from which actually the Visigothic monarchy tended to you know to to dwell to to develop right because the Iberian Peninsula is pretty big and it's also probably one of the most nightmarish terrains for every kind of military expedition so um, it was tough in centuries like the fifth the sixth to maintain an actual the seventh eventually um, control over it. Um, we have discussed these things in that video on, on the Visigoths proper. Um, and the Roman Emperor Avitus sent the Visigoths in Spain proper. Theodoric II, ruling between 453-466, invaded, in fact, uh, and defeated the king of the Suebi, Reciarius, at the Battle of River Orbigo in uh, 456, near Asturica Augusta, today's Astorca. Um, and then eventually sacked Braga Augusta, that is today's Braga, the Suebi capital. So the, the the Visigoths went on; they they, they sacked parts of Galatia. Uh, uh, they um, they quite brutally telling the truth that the Suebi resistance was, you know, in part that was they were massacred. Um, it was a pretty pretty tough way to to do that, and partly part of the reason being that it was peripheral regions were. Mm, it was worthy to to actually slaughter everybody <laughs> or a, a good part of them without actually caring much about local production because it was too out of reach in anyway so that's um mm, quite pure real politic um and um there was also at this point a first hint of the religious problems were taking place in here and they uh the local clergy for example supported the Suebi. So uh, the Visigoths even uh, attacked some holy places at the time. But Theodoric, anyhow, uh, took control at the end of the Hispania Baetica, the Carthaginensis, and uh, southern Lusitania. Right. So these broad areas of the, the, the south, uh, the, the Mediterranean stripe of, uh, of Spain, and, and part of today's Portugal. Um, and in 461, the Goths received the city of Narbonne again. There was, you know, so there was a bit of back and forth, even the same um, Aquitaine, as you realize, from the Emperor Libius Severus in exchange for the, their support. This eventually led to a revolt by the army by the Gallo Romans under Aegidius, and as a result, as a result, the Romans under um, Severus and Visigoths fought other Roman troops, and the revolt ended only in 465. Now, it's at this point that um, in 466, Eric, who was the youngest son of Theodoric, uh, Theodoric I, came to the Visigothic throne. He's kind of a fac fascinating figure, thought-provoking, he's kind of infamous for murdering his elder brother, Theodoric II, who had himself become king by murdering his elder brother, Torismund. So, yeah, Definitely not very uh, tranquil familiar relations, but that's what happens in places of power. But the important is that Eric, ruling between uh, 466 and 484, brought the Visigoths to expand further in Gaul, um, and consolidating at the same time their presence in the Imbarian Peninsula. Eric fought uh, again against the, 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 the Suebi, who still retained some influence in Lusitania. Um, and they, they, he had this uh, striking series of uh, success. But 
and he also expanded these chunks of the Iberian Peninsula were still under Roman control. For example, the Hispania Terraconensis, that was effectively the last bastion of Roman rule um, in, in the peninsula. And by 476, Eric had extended his rule to the Rhone and the Loire rivers. So basically, uh, this comprised most of southern Gaul, and this is what you can see in, in, in the um, great part of the maps that I put in here, right? So, basically these guys being settled initially just in what would be the Narbonensis and the Garonne Valley, they extend all over this broad Atlantic and continental part of Gaul. They even seize Provence after, um, you know, that that's... Uh, before the, the, the Ostrogoths actually came to, to prominence in the area. Um, and they came to border, quite more directly, the, uh, at the time the Roman domains of Soissons, later on eventually Frankish possession and the kingdom of the Burgundians. Right? And, and at this point the Visigothic kingdom reached its peak of power because basically controlled most the, the 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 wide majority of the Iberian Peninsula plus this enormous chunk of gold, right, one third of it, and incidentally the most developed areas of it, right. The Rhone Valley here is basically the uh, the channel of Mediterranean traffics f through Central Europe, right. Um, the, the 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 fertile plains of of Atlantic gold from the other side is are pretty fertile. Uh, the Narbonensis is, is this bastion of urbanized um, uh, areas that, you know, still represent this solid bulwark even against further, uh, you know, northern expansion, as it will happen uh, later on, as that was basically the only, um, well, it's kind of complicated. Let's say that, um, as we will see, that the, the, the Visigoths would retain this striped, uh, or stripe of gold after the Battle of Vouillet when they were defeated by the Franks, um, to state it, no, known as Septimania because it was known to be, uh, you know, crossable, say, in seven days on horseback. Um, that was, in fact, quite incidental. It was a deeply Romanized area, also had uh, Narbon, this, this very important centers on the coast, uh, etc. Um, and the um, Eric's expansion occupied these key cities as well, also of Arles, that had been seat of the prefect of Gauls, that uh, when after it had shift been shifted from Trier um, back in the day, and and also Marseille, that already at the time was a hell of a you know commercial center. It had been born like that back in the day as an Hellenic colony. Um, and as a result, so the, uh, this long introduction for arriving to the point that Eric um, effectively had counted on a portion of the Gallo-Roman and Hispano-Roman aristocracy who would serve him as generals and governors. Right. The Visigothic kingdom was formally recognized when the Western Emperor Julius Nepos was effectively the true last Roman Emperor, um, 473, 480. Uh, signed an alliance with Eric himself, granting him not only the, the, the lands south of the Loire and west of the Rhone in exchange for military service and the lands in Provence as well, including Arles and Marseille. Um, the lands in Hispania instead remained under de facto Visigothic control uh, by, by themselves. At that point, Visigoths had basically shifted great part of their... like the, the people had literally settled in there strategic key points, right? Um, it was in, in, in some ways the, the Visigothic settlement of, of the Iberian Peninsula, especially in the center, was was, was of, of military nature, right? There, there was also the, a strategic vision of the uh, Visigothic kings to actually found new cities, which is rare at the time in Europe, um, to control, right, and, and to extend properly mon the monarchic control over those lands. Um, um, so, and after Odoacer deposed the last Roman emperor in the west, Romulus Augustulus, Eric quickly recaptured province as well, um, a fact which the same Odoacer formally accepted in a treaty. 
and by the year 500 the Visigothic Kingdom centered at Toulouse controlled de facto um, Gallia Aquitania Gallia Narbonensis most of Hispania with the exception of the Suebic Kingdom of Galicia but you know um, the northwest and other small areas controlled by independent Iberian peoples such as the Basques and the Cantabrians right um, and this is a moment of political consolidation and stabilization Eric's son Alaric II 484-507 issued for example the very famous Bravi Braviarium Alaricid which we also addressed in our videos on medieval law his new body of laws essentially and also as we will see now held the, the famous church council at Agde in f 506 and in all this, we arrive at the end of the Visigothic rule of, of, of this, on this enormous ima uh, you know, amount of land in, in, in Aquitaine with the, the Merovingian expansion. Like the Visigothics came unavoidably. Uh, think that here the, the Western Roman Empire doesn't, ex doesn't exist anymore. So that minimal equilibrium and formality and reverence that had existed from the sign of these federati evaporates right yeah there are still there's still the eastern chunk of the empire that has now re reunited all the the, the western half uh, uh, the two halves I mean um, but it's it's fairly far right and at this point these guys can't really start deciding what, what's gonna happen there by themselves um, so the Visigoths came into conflict with the Franks under Clovis um, we we made a lot of videos about him um, who had conquered northern Gaul famously and that had come to, to border in fact the, the Visigoths on the Loire river and there was a fairly brief war uh, in which uh, the Franks basically invaded Aquitaine and Alaric was forced to put down also a rebellion in the Tarragonensis that uh, evidently had not uh, the Tar Tarragonensis was always a s um, thorn in the side for, for the Visigothic Kingdom ever like it's basically what would become eventually the, quite roughly the Kingdom of Aragon right it's as if already at the time there had been a sort of Castilian uh, area uh, dominated by uh, the gods even if Castilla didn't exist uh, of course as such and the Tarragonensis representing always this kind of objectively more Romanized area by certain standards that uh, had a kind of its own sphere of you know relations etc and then they rebelled continuously up to the up to the Islamic invasion it was a continuous a struggle to keep these lands down so as a consequence though um, the uh, the 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 Franks um, you know managed to attack again this time allied with the Burgundians and Alaric II was famously killed at a battle of Campus Vogladensis it's a battle of Vouillet uh, near Poitiers um, and uh, Toulouse was sacked so the biggest center there was basically um, you know st stormed and by f 508 the Visigoths had de facto lost most of their Gallic holdings save Septimania in the south. What is interesting and fascinating is that Aquitaine in this regard didn't quite fall uh, under a firm f Merovingian rule. I mean the Merovingians of course ruled from Aquitaine but even in there it was a kind of a fair, far away land from the, the true core of Francia. Aquitaine was not Francia. Aquitaine was like uh, Burgundia uh, was like Alamannia, right? So these areas that the Franks basically ruled from this core, you know, ethnic uh, land where they had settled now in in the Belgica area, and um, and Aquitaine was always to remain a bigger chunk, always framed within the let's say the, the Frankish um, the Frankish Empire, and later on the the Western Frankish Kingdom as such. Um, but still in a decentralized position and the the Franks never up to the, the you know the the, the fr Frankization let's say in, in the lower middle ages basically never quite and beyond telling the truth never quite managed to 
to control directly those areas. Like it was al always complicated to 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 make these people really fitting under their domination. Um, even though this happened naturally through through the elites, like the elites were this easier way to co-opt essentially um, that could control those lands on your behalf. But the population in general would remain suspended, especially in the very early Middle Ages between Francia and um, the Gothia, as we could call it. Um, and this increased its own um, autonomy, its own difference, right, with the rest of, uh, from, from the rest of the neighbors. These areas, as we've seen, were fairly rich and advanced, and they, they hadn't, like it happened in Gaul most of the times, not undergone the mass destructions that other areas of, of the empire had undergone. Like, areas like Britain and Italy, for example, were really, like, okay, well, it was not Armageddon, right? There was a continuity, of course, with Roman tradition. It was quite evident, especially in the south. But, um, let's say that um, countries like, especially s s uh, southern Gaul in Spain, maintained a, a much more direct Roman continuity in terms of administrative um, and political structures uh, than the than even Italy at that point. This is because they didn't the the, the, the Sustratum had not gone destroyed during the invasion. It was never a you know people that arrived and raised everything to the ground or uh, a major war, which actually never happened. But think about what happened in the Italian Peninsula with during the, the Byzantine Reconquest, right? It, that was really what leveled everything to the ground, not the Longobard invasion, which actually was largely non-violent, especially in the areas where the Longobards effectively settled, right? In 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 Gaul in Spain was a you know substantial cooperation um, between the elites, the Germanic elites, and the and the Romanized elites, uh, which is probably uh, you know it, it was in, in in part a problem. Like and this was a problem especially for the Visigoths proper, because the Franks were quite clever to dynasticize, let's say, the Merovingian domination as such, and to, um, in a certain sense, uh, knock out all the possible rivals since the very beginning and cooperating with local, especially Episcopal elites. Visigothic Spain, the problem was a bit more complicated because the, uh, the monarchy started actually pretty well, and the process of consolidation of the kingdom at the beginning, especially from a military point of view, was quite successful. But what happened is that the monarchy basically shrank in power uh, because of the of the fusion, let's say, of the Visigothic nobility, of the rest of the Visigothic nobility, let's say, better, and the gallo iberian excuse me, the Romano-Iberian nobility, that began to act essentially as a as a power on their own, and the most direct consequence of these were the councils of Toledo that we have made a video on but we have to remake it because I think it was one of the earliest ones and I I, I you know explained things a bit more effectively now that was essentially a this incredibly important and dramatically overlooked institution which basically checked um, monarchic power. They they could uh, they could even excommunicate the, the Visigothic king. They could uh, they, they de facto elected it, right? It is this kind of fusion between the you know the, the ecclesiastical sacralization of the monarchy but at the same time the elective um, decision of, of the Germanic people in arms, right? Ideally, right? The idea that uh, the, the dramatic problem of all Germanic peoples, uh, at least for what concerns their elites, that you know the middle class, the the the, the freemen didn't want uh, someone more powerful than them. They just wanted to elect someone every once in a while for war, right? But this could work in continental Europe, could work in places where there was no actual territorial um, domination viable on on a on a you know con continual base. Uh, while you, you occupy the lands of the Western Empire, you need to structure uh, a territorial dominion that has necessary to stratify uh, 
uh, and, and verticize the politics in society, right? But uh, it was still difficult for Latin Germanic standards at this point to, to achieve any form of centralization, which effectively no, um, you know, no Latin Germanic kingdom ever managed to reproduce uh, for for centuries and, t and centuries. Like there were certain systems that were heading towards a quite a good direction at one point, but they were still somewhat fragile systems um, at the end of the day. And in the case of the Visigoths, basically the monarchy was, if not aborted as such, because the institution always remained, also because it was a quite you know useful tool even for the same for the same aristocracy that was behind the councils of Toledo and its bishops, etc. Uh, but it didn't quite head towards a you know a concrete uh, centralization, I and mean, not even has a direction, right? Um, and we could talk uh, really for a lot of time about this, but it, it's not the case, um, since we should theoretically talk about something else today. Um, but um, the councils of Toledo, we will will be discussed on another occasion, because they pertain chiefly to the moment of Catholicization of of the of the Visigoths that happens in the sixth century. Uh, after not a few struggles, telling the truth, and that was the weakness of the Aryan kingdoms that tried to, you know, to maintain this kind of conserv traditionalist bulk of, um, let's say, ethnical, uh, ethnic Germanic aristocracy that, for reasons that were all but identitary, actually, but strictly political, wanted to maintain essentially the control um, of, of, of the kingdom in a situation in which basically it was impossible to do right the the visigothic kingdom was uh, was was strong and compact as soon as it was threatened by this mm, um, quite um, you know mm, uh, troublesome um, neighbors that definitely uh, were compromising uh, the stabilization of the same of the same visigothic uh, settlement but um as, as soon as you know these guys are um, basically pacified and marginalized um the local nobility basically stops following the sovereign and and, and starts putting some limits to, to its power um and and that's the catholic side of it uh, it's as if like to wanting to approximate brutally, even though it, it it's just a model, so th there are exceptions in it. It's not used to describe exactly what happened. It's as if you know the the monarchy was backed by the 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 Germanic uh, party, the Germanic Aryan party, and the uh, the rest of the population was uh, let's say the rest of the nobility was backed by the Romano Catholic part, and um, and the latter won. Right, simply because they were more, they had more power. They they represented the great landowners of the Iberian Peninsula that hadn't been massively disrupted either, um, so that they had effective power because they had settled and seized these lands. So it was impossible for the monarchy to come there and take it out, right? Because that would have caused, uh, you know, a coup d'état. We can't say, and that was the real problem. And that eventually forced uh, the Visigothic kings to convert to Catholicism from Arianism and therefore to to put an end to what had what happened actually also in other in other Romano Germanic kingdoms of this problem, right, uh, of the you know, of the religious differences of, of the various creeds, because this happened for the Mandals, it happened for the Ostrogoths, it happened for the Longobards. Uh, at the end of the day, these guys had to give up. These populations needed to be Catholic because the overwhelming majority of the population was talking about millions of people, right, in Spain, in Italy, in Africa, um, and and also in, in Gaul, um, were Catholic since centuries, and they uh, there was no way like a few tens of thousands of armed warriors could make a difference in that context, right? And if you really wanted to structure, um a territorial dominion of monarchic uh, character, you needed to give up Arianism as such. And in some places it happened also relatively 
um, you know, it, we don't have to think there were actual persecutions um, of Catholics um, outside of the, you know, the political clash between groups. There were certain countries where we know about the struggle, but we don't see any form of, of persecution proper, right? If you look at Longobard, Italy, for example, they, the, there's no persecution of any kind. Um, so at the beginning, the, the, the certain Catholic bishops were expelled and substituted with Aryan ones, like in Vandalic Africa, like in the same Visigothic, um, you know, Iberia or Gaul. But effectively, you know, persecution of the actual populations, destruction of churches, it's not something that is so evident here, right? In the case we've seen before against the Suebi, was was due to the fact that it was invading a foreign land with a local style clergy and therefore raising to the ground certain foundations of, you know, churches at this point were rich, right? It was a strategical move. Um, so there's no need here to stress this as long as we understand that f throughout all the 5th century, so in this phase of actual stabilization of the Zygotic power uh, across Gaul and, and Iberia, um, the the Visigothic rulers had naturally to deal as Aryans with a largely Catholic population, but not all, not only, um, but Catholic clergy that represented, especially in Gaul, um, but also in Spain, the um, the the pinnacle of local Romanized society. Right, Gaul was effectively in the hands of of the bishops from an administrative point of view. There was the, these armies of Romano-Germanic troops that were either Roman or belonging to these um, uh, feder uh, federati kings, right? But the land assets here were largely in the hands of the church. It was dramatically powerful, and this is especially true in Gaul. Gaul has, in this phase, um, an enormous importance. We made a lot of videos about this. I mean, the, the cultural importance and production of late medieval gold is uh, the greatest in the West. Um, it's um, this clergy was dramatically educated. Uh, they were rich. They were powerful. They actually had their own military. When the Visigoths under uh, Eric invade these areas of Auvergne, as we will see now, well, actually, uh, well, the, the 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 local cities were defended militarily by the bishops. Bishops had their militia. They had their clientels. They were they were essentially the guys who had taken over after the Roman public government had evaporated, right? Or simply, to, to put it simply, more simply, the the bishops had seized the same prerogatives of of, of the Roman governors on behalf of the same emperor, right? So that's that's quite meaningful. The church was very well organized at this point; had a, a very efficient. Um, net of, of administration of contacts of of uh, they cooperated quite right and, and it was a, an organism that if you wanted to rule in Gaul or, or in Spain you had necessarily to recon uh, as a uh, as an interlocutor necessarily right the 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 genius of of, of a man like like Clovis was that unlike all these other um, Aryans. Um, as a German, he basically decided to transition directly from paganism to Catholicism, always given that these populations naturally were already in a kind of transient phase that we it, it's difficult to, to to photograph, let's say, because even the gods, right, we, we were the gods when they arrived in, in Aquitaine, were they Aryans proper? Well, actually not. Well, I mean, they were still largely pagan. And even those who were Christian, sometimes were actually both things at the same time. Because for for a polytheist, there is nothing strange in actually being Christian and a pagan at the same time. I mean, it perfectly makes sense. It effectively does, right? Um, for for from their point of view, and naturally the, the progressive Christianizations of these peoples passes through the dilution of of of, of these of of their demographics uh, in, in, into into the locals that were overwhelmingly more than them. But uh, it's obvious that we are also looking at the world in which, yeah, maybe the 
you know, the, the urban elites were deeply Christianized because at that point being Christian equated to be Roman, literally. Uh, but naturally, if you look at the countryside, we, we, we perfectly know that the majority of people were, yeah, maybe sometimes they were nominally Christian indeed, but they still basically believed in what they had always believed since, you know, thousands of years, the natural cycles uh, of, of the fields, the of the agricultural deities, etc. And actually, the, the church was perfectly fine with that, right? It took a long time before these cults were, um, if not mm, forgotten, which which is hard to tell, actually, whether it even happened at one point, but they were at least Christianized in some form. But, you know, if, if a peasant remained a pagan, what did a bishop care? The important thing is that the bishop had a, a clientele uh, a retinue that could maintain its territorial domination. In the domination, the peasant just worked the lands, for, uh, for, uh, land for him. Point. What did he care? Was it a competitor? Was paganism a competitor of Christianity in the first place? Well, actually not. There is no comparison in terms of level of you know of, of development of even of, of, of doctrine of ideas. Actually, the, the the main problem of Christianity was Christianity in itself in the form of of heresies, and that's why Arianism was such a big problem in, in some measure. But even in here, Arianism was not much of a of a doctrinal choice from the side of the Germans, especially. It was just a way of saying, basically, look, we are basically uh, we are Christian because we realize that when we we deal with the Romans. The, they are Christian, and they can legitimize us in, in, in the control of these lands only if we are Christian ourselves. So we basically convert to Christianity formally. It was mostly an elite process. Um, but we retained this other view of Christ, which is much closer to, I don't know, Thor. Uh, ideally, like the, the Aryan Christ is, is fundamentally a much more um, human figure and is it resembles much more of a hero of the Germanic in the Germanic mentality, then of course it is uh, the Christ of, uh, of of the Nicene's. But um, and there is a properly doctrinal uh, difference. But the German doesn't care. I mean, these people are even barely literate. The point, what really makes the difference, is that Arianism allows you to be Christian, but at the same time, some posing yourself in a bit of a different relation towards the empire. Um, this is important probably also for other reasons that are the same control of the local clergy, um, or better, the same local, mm, you know, uh, hierarchy in some ways, because now it's complicated to explain it, but naturally uh, this is a problem, however, that they get rid with territorialization, because at that point they have to build churches, and yes, they install, as we've seen, Aryan priests, but, you know, th this gets diluted quite quickly in many ways. Um, what really matters at this point is really the international scenario. I mean, it's the idea that, yeah, you settle into Roman lands, but you don't want to feel as if you're a Roman subject. So if you're an Aryan, you're basically saying, look, we are something different here. We, we, are, we accept to cooperate with you, but we want still to be a power on our own. In fact, uh, the Fedus was seen, even you know, culturally speaking, in different ways uh, from from the Romans and from the Germans. It was a very different view of what this this relation was actually practically was. But once again, realpolitik, right? Uh, these guys had their own power. They, they were a core of strength. They they had either to be diluted or annihilated, brought from your side. Uh, the days in which you could simply slaughter a people and get rid of it were, were far away, and sometimes Roman now didn't... Uh, this appears in the 5th century in the West, right? But also before, couldn't really... We've seen with, with Etius, right? First you fight against the Visigoths, then you need them to fight against the Huns. Um, it's it's all like this, and you can't do much about it. Even the same Franks that are uh, fundamentally... Yeah, the... Uh, allies of Rome, but th th what does that actually mean? I mean, all these peoples were, at some point, allies of Rome and enemies of Rome, right? It's just the distance that doesn't make the Franks and the Romans friction up to the point in which in the 6th century there is the, the Reconquista and the uh, 
and they border once again because that's really the problem right as we've seen it just with like with the Visigoths here where when do the problems begin with the with the Franks when they start bordering each other right in all of this we we don't know much right we we don't see uh, i mean we we rarely have any germanic account right these are this uh, the 6th century is, is the moment in which the germans quite with quite quite of a difficulty they begin first of all to 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 start thinking that they are german in the first place because that was a, a historiographical invention in some ways it, it's the first century in which they start writing something on their own right as properly ethnic read juridical germans right um but l overwhelmingly so and of course and naturally all what we know about these worlds is roman right romanized in this case gallo roman if we have to look at it because these guys were the truly educated ones the, these were the, the true uh inheritors let's say of the cultural legacy of cl the classical world and we have these dramatic figures right uh, that we will now give a look at um, always considering that these people were a very high social status like a bishop of a major Gallic city was very often part of the imperial environment you have the imperial milieu you know, even from a parental point of view as we will see now so the Visigothic kings, um, while they were still in Aquitaine, um, they they had naturally to, to treat these people in a very careful way. And although they were Aryans, mm, um, as Visigoths, they still respected the Catholic organization of the Latin population, and they had, in fact, cordial relations cordial and and fruitful relations um, even with those bishops that had fought against them right this was particularly necessary for the pacification of Aquitaine under the Gothic dominion there was no other way out you couldn't rule a land of cities like the Roman Empire was that were ruled at the time by by bishops by disrespecting these bishops and and this is a very I care very much about this topic because uh, it shows how effectively um, much of the attrition that we somewhat picture when we think about this sorry well, wasn't quite there right was it and it wasn't really even religious here the Visigothic kings were Aryan but they still were perfectly fine with interacting uh, with in the lands that they possessed now on behalf of the same empire with with Catholic bishops now think even about the the system of um, uh, the cultural system of reference here like that were very different minded people I mean just imagine what what a Visigothic shifting of the beginning of the fifth century could be I mean these people had left Central Europe from just basically a generation um, and think about the system of values, the beliefs, the the, the ethos, right? And think about what it was a, a Roman bishop of such deeply Romanized areas like, like Aquitaine or Southern Gaul in general. But there is a process of acculturation, we can say, of civilization that, that happens in here. These guys do not slaughter each other. These guys cooperate. And and if we can say that great part of Europe today actually is of Latin and Germanic origin and, and, and this has become a synthesis especially in these lands where the Romano-Germanic kingdoms proper were established we owe it to the dialogue, the cooperation um, and the intelligence of these elites always and this is valid in the same exact way I don't know think about the Byzantines and, and the Slavs uh, later the, the Germans and the Slavs I mean and and this dialogue was 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 uh, definitely um, un undertaken through the uh, religious organization I mean through what at the time objectively consisted in uh, uh, let's say composed great part of what a territorial dominion had to be 
because the church controlled a lot of land, controlled a lot of power, presented a sedentary model per excellence, because with the only exception of Ireland, basically, um, the uh, the Roman Catholic model was firmly uh, the urban, like the dioceses were all corresponding to 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 cities. This was true since the times of the, of the Roman administration. It actually had made overlapping the. In fact, they had created a public admin, uh, uh, district that, was, that overlapped with the Christian diocese as such, and under Diocletian, famously enough, um, that had a great power in its own. So uh, this dialogue brought to that um, connubium between the uh, imperium and sacerdotium, right, that would be at the base also of, um, of the medieval power at the highest level think about the the, the empire and, and the church in general as universal powers of our division of church and state that other countries in the world um, hadn't had at that point so even in these systems that were definitely relatively you know primitive that they took a lot of time before they could you know grow in and and structure something more consistent but these two ideas, the idea that there is, there is um, that 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 the government must must based on consensus on political parties, is something that begins in the dialogue of the imperium and the sacerdotium, and at the highest level, because it's not a mere ratio of strength, right? It's not a mere ratio of strength. Here, these bishops, yes, they have their own retinues, they have their own power, but they don't have their own kingdoms, they don't have their own armies, right? They they are something different. So it's their spiritual power, it's their um, positive, constructive, um, civilized motivation of giving a stability to these systems that really makes this military classes of the German aristocracy that were used just to, you know, to arrive there and, and raise everything to the ground, like the Visigoths did against the Suebi, that was pretty beautifully exemplified, to think that violence is necessary, because violence got Christianized, um, secularly speaking, but that there is also a, a higher level, right? There is another dimension of life, there is another there is an absolute value of, of morality and of, um, of 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 material advantage at the same time, right? And this is very very important, and you can look at it basically. It happened everywhere. Um, these pagans or Aryans went to rule o over Catholic areas. Damn it! Happened. It happened in Britain. It happened in Gaul. It happened in Spain. It happened in Italy. It happened in 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 Africa. Just to talk about the former Western Roman Empire, right? It happened in the East as well, right? And it went on for for a long time. So, we are born as Westerners from that base, right? We really come straight out of that, and I think a lot of advantages of Western civilization derive. Not only, of course, but mm, in, in, in good part and in very solid part from this specifically. And we have these great figures that um, that led the process, that let us know how they effectively took place. And that's why today we talk about Sidonius Apollinaris, that you've probably uh, heard of. We're never discussing here. That is this great character of Auvergne, right? Auvergne, as we've seen at the beginning, is this eastern part of Aquitaine at the time, in the core of France, uh, central southern France. He was a writer, a poet, right? Um, and uh, committed uh, at the highest level in the political life of Roman Gaul. And he is a bishop. Was Bishop of Arverni, which is today's um, Clermont-Ferrand, during the expansion of the Visigoths in Auvergne, right? So exactly in that moment, so in this dramatic moment, because he fought against the Visigoths as a bishop of Clermont-Ferrand, he took arms against them, and as we will see now, he was 
you know, he had organized the, the, the military defense of the city. He was captured by the Visigoths and kept as prisoner. And then eventually he was given back to his episcope because um, he was respected by the Visigoths and if, who in fact honorably welcomed him eventually in, at the royal court so much that he... Um, um, habituated as he was in the past to compose certain official panegyrics in praise of Roman emperors, now he composed one in honor of the Visigothic king, an Arian Visigothic king. This was a Catholic bishop who perfectly marries the uh, Visigothic policy because he realizes that his community and can and, and, and has to cooperate with its newcomers. It's also, it, the Bible says it too, like this is a deep uh, concept. It's the idea that God has wanted this in a, in a preconceived plan, that you must obey in respect. You have to be obsequious. You don't have to be passively subdued. You have to to begin this dialogue uh, that eventually will come, in fact, to, to Catholicize, right, the Visigoth. Th this didn't happen because of Sidonius of Olinaris and uh, himself, right, it was a, as we've seen, a big process. But um, the, um, you know, the, the general picture is definitely the one of a, of a great um, and constant dialogue that goes on, because there were moments, that were strained moments, right? I, I, for example, during the, uh, exactly in the years in which the Visigoths were about to incorporate Auvergne, this was the last decade of life of the Roman Empire of Ravenna, right? Um, the, the Visigoths now were oriented towards the policy of radical uh, impairment of the autonomy of Catholic churches. This was the level of, of, of persecution that existed here. Like, it was not a matter of imposing a, a creed here. It was a matter of saying, we need you to, to be faithful to us because we know that you have power here and woe to you if you dare go against us. So it was a very delicate situation. You know, as we've seen, there were the Burgundians from the uh, one side were still... Um, at the north uh, of Gaul, still under Roman administration, so it was not a moment in which um, this is under Eric, right? Um, the everything was so easy, right? There, w there was a decline of the West, but at the same time, it was a struggle for power among the the, the, the survivors there, and so it was a, always a delicate situation, uh, even in the same. Um, in those regions, as we've seen, that were already Visigothic, right? Not over it was about to be to be seized, and uh, and in general, th this is a bigger problem of the of what was left in the in the Roman West um, in itself. So Sinalus Apollinaris, just uh, a word um, about his, it, it, just to make you understand the the character. Um, I mean, his grandfather and his father were. Land owners in Gaul, right? Very wealthy ones, right? This is the per, the, the core concept also of the fir, um, of the continuity of uh, r Roman organization in Gaul and in Spain. I mean, it's it's really about the uh, wealth distribution. It's about the integrity of the Roman latifundum, right? In Britain, it gets wiped out. In Italy, it gets wiped out. Um, in Gaul, in Spain, it does not. So these people actually own um, a lot of land because these had already or uh, held the office of prefects of Praetorium of the Gauls. I mean, this family of Sidonius Apollinaris was the one of Praetorian prefects of the Gauls. Hence, those who actually administered Gaul on behalf of of of, of Rome, right? This had happened under the reigns of Theodosius and Valentinian the mm Third, -hmm. um, and the same wife of Sidonius, because bishops could marry without any problem um, at the time. 
in, in, in Catholicism, Pia, uh, Papianilla, right, belonged to a noble family of Auvergne, right? So there was naturally, um, now we talk about Gallo-Romans proper, and these were people that were descendants of the Roman uh, governors, the Roman colonists, as well as the local Celtic elites that were co-opted by the Romans since centuries. So the, in Gaul had already lived quite deeply this very concrete bond, right, between, in that case, between the Romans who were the invaders, right, and the, the Gauls who were the autochthonous population. But Gaul was a dramatic success of Romanization in this regard, especially in these areas. There were it's certain areas of Gaul that were definitely not as Romanized. Think about the Bagauda, in fact, that did exist in, in Gaul and in Spain, but th this came from, in fact, the least Romanized areas, were incidentally also the poorest ones. So, uh, yeah, that it's always the same pattern, basically. That's what Romanization fundamentally is. That's where the Roman Empire sets its, its, its pillars, we can say. Um, Sidonius had recitated in, in 456 this official panegyric of his father-in-law, Nonetheless, that Emperor Avitus. So he were talking about imperial uh, family, right? And and for this reason, Sidonius had the honor of having a statue of himself in Trajan's Forum. And and when Avitus was eventually was overthrown, Sidonius also was clever enough to save his position by resigning a panegyric. Uh, for the new, the new emperor, Majorianus. Um, you think it may str be strange? I mean, uh, um, it, um, it, it it's a strange craft. One of the eulogists in, in in the late Roman times. It can be weird for us, but actually, it was very important because these panegyrics weren't just about art. It was literally political speeches, and they were extremely important. They corresponded to very peculiar models. This is um. Tradition eventually would go on chiefly in, in Constantinople, quite famously at the point of that, you know, uh, there were certain specific models that we can see as somewhat sclerotic, but that actually, uh, exactly because they, they are fixed within a, s a particular frame, kind of need a lot of ingenuity to, to improve and to, to develop. So, um, always think here, imperial power is sacred. As we often say, and this be, should be sculpted in every person's mind in the world, the Roman Empire had exclusively a religious foundation. There was no other type of foundation ever an empire could have in the first place, right? Um, so all of this was more than just, um, let's say, politics. It was all one, again, with, uh, with religion. In, in I mean in, in a in a spiritual but also moral sense, right? The, the idea that there is a connection between politics and uh, religious morals is is another big and important uh, burden that that requires a lot of responsibility to bear, in fact, um, and that does have practical consequences for the life of the people. Um, Sidonius composed also another panegyric, the one of Antemius that. In 468, brought to Sidonius the office of prefect of Rome and the title of patrician. So here we're talking really about the highest levels of Roman administration. Right. So Sidonius is um, the the truest elite of Roman culture of the time, in all senses, right? Um, in 471 or 472, even when he was still a layman, right, um, he was elected bishop of uh, Arverne, or Arverna, uh, I think it varies in the sources, Clermont Ferrand, and he brought um, his new, uh, in his new dignity, the most great uh, seriousness of intentions by organizing as we have seen, also the resistance against Elric and, and the Visigoths. So think about, this is a Roman soul, right? So it's not a matter of, uh, there wasn't, like we, we see often the Romans is kind of more open towards um, the, 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 the barbarians, right? Um, 
but um, you have to think that at this point being in a Rome and has a, a sound identity, especially for such committed people like the elites. Um, so the opening to the Germans, to, to the Roman culture, we see as something, as a great step of civilization, but just think that the Romans had their own strong cultural resistance res res uh, too, right? So he, uh, he, as we have seen, he was actually he fought and, and and was captured by Eric, right? And what happens is that, as we have seen, Nepos grants to the Visigothic king the rule on on those uh, areas of southern Gaul, where the same Nepos uh, was was in charge. Um, excuse me, uh, yeah, Nepos of course, but also Sidonius I meant had his office. Uh, well, at that point, you have basically your emperor as a Roman telling you that you must be under these guys and and as we've seen after this phase of captivity he managed even to 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 obtain the sympathy of King Eric with this poem in, in verses right naturally Sidonius was educated in classical culture um, uh, that was often scholastically assimilated at the time uh, he was educated to the cult of Roman tradition, but at the same time, um, and this is very important as well, we were saying about it before, it was, I mean, he was very attached in, in many ways to his native land, right? These were Romans, but the beauty of, of, of Romanity is exactly this one. You can be Roman, uh, I mean, you are Roman, and that's a great honor, and it's a huge prestige, but still... You have your own customs. You you retain your own your your own traditions, your own language, your own customs of any kind. So Sidonius Apollinaris, in this sense, is the most typical exponent of the Latin cul uh, culture and civilization in Roman Gaul. He's a Gaul, right? A Gallo-Roman, I'd say better. Okay, so. Um, and there was this strife um, in it, because there is a, s a feeling of Romanity that is very alive, especially if you read his work. Uh, I mean, Sidonius expresses it very well, but there is also this kind of incipient, um, you know, uh, local identity, uh, say, th this local identity that really makes itself felt. There is a pride to be a Gallo-Roman, to come from Gaul, to come from Auvergne, to have a this territorial reference. Uh, Sidonius knows very well what the Gaul is at this point, knows what its importance, what its role in, a, in the Roman Empire, because even when they are under the Visigoths, these people believe that they are under the Empire. The same Visigoths do in part, and it, it doesn't end, right? Southern Gaul, in the air, it's, it's Roman, right? It kept being Roman, even during Justinian reconquest, the century after. Uh, we know that uh, we don't have news of uh, of Byzantine troops occupying uh, southern Gaul, but we know there were many southern Gallic cities that kept uh, striking, you know, imperial coins, minted imperial coins. I mean, and um, because that's the only point of reference, the Roman Empire is not an empire. Roman Empire is the and only empire possible because it's a Christian empire it, and and it's the divine empire in the first place for everybody involved it doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or a pagan but the Roman Empire is there standing and, and there is only one way that is possible that the divinity has wanted it so whichever you believe in whether you are a Catholic or an Arian or a pagan or maybe you don't even know because you're a <laughs> you're a mix of all of these things. But Rome is divine power, and that's why uh, it's important from the Visigothic side to also captivate uh, Romanity and to obtain its favor. So what the hell we know about what Eric thought about Sidonius? Maybe he's a look at this son. Uh, you know, he, he even fought against me. Maybe some of his warriors were killed even by the resistance at Clermont-Ferrand. But that was a person that was necessarily to be taken in consideration and to be showed sympathy to, because uh, 
that was the base for building a renum as such. And the Germans believed in this sacrality as well. And do, do not think that they... I mean, they believed that God had fin or the gods had smiled to them in that regard, because, hey, they were ruling there, not the Romans anymore. But at the same time, they, they, they thought it as probably they shared that divine mandate together with the Romans. That was the obsession of the peoples of that time. That victory equates to divine legitimization. And this is true both for the pagans from many, many centuries before and for the Christians now. Um, so what else could we say about Sidonius, of course? Um, well, he wrote this work that, in, in, that consists of 24 poems in examiners, elegiac distics or, or indecasyllables, and he, if we have 147 letters um, that he himself collected in nine books that were published eventually um, between 469 and 479. And, uh, yeah, they're very important because essentially it's, um, it, they, they represent this ex faithful expression of the life and culture and feelings of Roman Gaul at the end of the 5th century. And, and Sidonius is very acute. Um, he is, he is mm, as an observer, he's also very, um, he has taste, right? He exposes facts, the important ones, but also the lesser ones. I mean, he, um, as it's, it's also, by the way, the kind of the unique source at which we can, um, from which we can draw information concerning the political, social, and literary life of Gaul in that time. So it, it's one of really those great figures, as will be Gregory of Tours. Um, you know, Isidore of Seville eventually just remained this broader um, Galliberian uh, dimension. This, this is important because uh, I would like to stress that if you look at the cultural history of those lands in the early Middle Ages, you see that there is a continuity, right? This idea, we, we've talked uh, more than once about, um, we made, I think, two videos about Gerbert of Aurillac, right? Uh, he was from Auvergne, too, and we know he was a prominent figure in the 10th century. He was Pope, and so he went studying in Spain. It was this great and strong, at that time there were the Muslims in part, but there was this great Visigothic legacy, especially in the north, that had permeated southern Gaul, like this idea of Occitan as tied to Spain. You, I can tell you, if you traveled there, if you go to places like Toulouse, or Carcassonne, uh, etc., you, you can smell this air of magic, the, the air of Spain, the air of the, the Mediterranean, this um, um, heartily and uh, uh, passionate um, feeling and, and taste and, and, and wit. Like the, the, um, There was an enormous cultural development in those areas. The, those were areas of frontier with the great um, works, the great translations during the Arab period from, from the Atlantic, from, from the Arabic, that the Latins studied heavily. They were, these were, uh, in many ways, they were the heirs of this same Gallo-Roman aristocracy that had maintained the sense of itself, the sense of education, the sense of being part of a universal picture. Gerbert of Rillac, in this sense, is he who is even capable of surpassing the um, the factionalism of the local churches and creating a universalistic model for the church to be that will feed also ideally the Gregorian um, reform. But he was uh, th there was this prejudice of of being the magician, the evil guy, the person who was so educated, but also in in in, in the darkness, you know, in the dark side of 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 knowledge of the the idea of uh, the the forbidden cults of wanting to know more, too much of for what the intellectual pride of a of a humble of honest Christian should be, um, and because these people were, I mean. Gerbert wasn't uh, quite of a... He, he was of humble origin, but um, it, it's the culture, it's the, the air, it's the landscape, it's, it's the tongue 
that was echoing these these times. There were troubled times. There were times that uh, they weren't very far in time. If you, I mean, ideally, well, half of a millennium, of course, but still, um, life changed much slower at that time. So there was time to consolidate a tradition, uh, um, you know, a sentiment, um, a general um, sensitivity to to culture and education. So we can look at these figures and realizing that that world was um, was needing that specific um, vision because it was a world in which it seemed as if the center was lost um, in his lifetime um, Isidore so uh, excuse me um, Sidonis so the Western Empire fallen well, do, do you know what it means um, it, it's 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 steep. Like we we rightfully think that naturally in 476, the the average inhabitant of the Western Roman Empire didn't perceive absolutely anything, right? 476 is probably one of the emptiest dates ever. But for a um, the ultra Roman elite. <laughs> of such high office and, and position and, and status to hear that Odoacer had sent back the Roman imperial insignia back to Constantinople. Ah, well, that must have changed a lot of things. They understood it. They couldn't see how the thing would have evolved, right? Because chunks of Rome were still there. There were still Siagris in the north, was still uh, Nepos, as we've seen in, in no recommend in those areas there um, but uh, this wasn't the world that he had he had been born in anymore so these are figures that for us are uh, probably some of the most um, important fascinating to um, to reflect on, because of course we we don't have an excess excessive much about him. We can even think uh, apparently that his production was modest in some way. Maybe we can look at this and say, well, but you know, this has nothing to do with classical education. These were already half barbarians. Well, this is wrong judgment. This is not contextualizing, um, and therefore not being able to compare uh, in relative terms the greatness of a mind in in these times were the um in fact the the loss of of so much stability and and model had to be compensated with something new with innovation innovation is always um um a product of crisis right and that's why there is always a hope in every crisis because there is the chance in spite of the tragedy to create something new or something better right and this is what i think we also believe as that th there is an improvement, that there is a difference that it makes to f um, to choose something instead than something else. We we don't in the West we don't have a passive reception of what it has to be. We we still have it's as if you know we we have absorbed the Christian ideal that yes um, this all shall pass because we live in lands that do not belong to us uh, truly, but we also have this barbarian spirit right in, in the best sense imaginable in the idea that the individual can make the difference that that the individual can take um, in his hands the the, um, the 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 direction of his own destiny um, even in the face of God right that we don't have just to to accept everything that happens we have to react because there is a moral duty the behind it. This is a challenge naturally many, many other peoples uh, have, but this combination um, is very peculiar, right? There is a, a true um, uniqueness in this guy, and it was um, gestated, uh, we can't say, exactly in this point. This mo point of late antiquity is definitely um, uh, a moment of great uh, revision of of life, of the role of politics, and of the individuals in the world. So it's reading these 
um, characters that were definitely part of the elite and they had they were very privileged in their own regard they had they, they had a very particular status but they also had a lot of responsibility in this regard so they they were the ones who made the real big choices right that we can't see um, what it effectively meant to to be at that time um, let's say um, a big change um, talking always about 476 um, and broadening a bit more the picture maybe coming a bit back on the Visigoths themselves is that the, the loss of Ravenna I mean the fall of Ravenna <laughs> proper um, and and therefore the the complete autonomy from a Roman domination in Gaul um, helped paradoxically to consolidate the new modus vivendi of the Visigothic kingdom and the Catholic episcopate. This is important because it's as if now you're out there on your own. So instead of splitting further, because you maybe have mixed allegiance, right? Of course, as we've seen, men as Sidonians always looked at Rome as much as they could. This is what contemporarily will do now the, the Roman senators in Italy when Theodoric, king of the Ostrogoths, will come to rule them, right? And that will trigger the disastrous um, Gothic War. Um, but in, in Gaul specifically, it, it, it's more far away, right? And there are other groups in there. And um, the Catholic Episcopate of places like Auvergne, uh, like Aquitaine, like the Narbonenses, generally participate from the side of, of the Goths, even though they are Aryan, because the Goths treat the Catholics well, after all. After all. Right? There are certain measures, of course, that must be taken to secure the loyalty of these people. Because always remember it, that, once again, it's important to stress it, these elites would have always done better to, to come back to Rome, ideally. Right, it was, there were pretty sound interests in, in in this. Like the Visigothic kingdom, as such, was a was a smaller um, uh, center of power. Like it was framed within the, the Roman world in some ways, but it was more limited. Then, of course, when the Roman world evaporates, you you don't have another thing to compare. You're under the Visigoths in a moment in which they're at the acme of their power. These guys control basically most of the Iberian Peninsula and all of southern Gaul. They're an enormous power. As a matter of fact, the Visigoths in this very moment are the strongest power in the West, right? B before the rise of the Ostrogoths, that will partly even kind of incorporate them in a benign way um, as uh, peers <laughs> or uh, akin, uh, as kings, let's say, as gods. But eventually, especially the Merovingians, um, uh, Merovingian Francia, right? But it's important that these locals choose the Visigoths because probably they have understood that among all the other barbarians around, uh, talking especially about the Burgundians, the Alamanni, and the Franks concerning concerning Gaul, where they were, right? The Iberian Peninsula is another thing, right? It's just a case in the sense that the the Visigoths have managed to be to span across the, the Pyrenees and to to have this enormous power, but an Arvernian is is a goal, and that's what they see. They think that the Visigoths are better, because probably they have realized that among all of these peoples, they are mo the most Romanized. They are the ones that have more continuity with the Roman uh, model, and they, indeed it is true, because as we've seen, the Goths, uh, especially the Visigoths, were the most Romanized of all the Germans, and the Franks weren't. Hell, not even the Alamanni were definitely. Um, the Burgundians were kind of more, but still, you know, kind of less slightly, and they were less powerful, let's be honest. So you also want to stick from the side of the strongest, who can, can who is more stable and can provide for more um, stability. Um, and probably it, it also has more, at, at that point, there is more economic reasons for it, because the Rhone Valley, as we've seen, is, is controlled by the Visigoths. The important assets 
uh, in southern f Gaul and uh, think about all the, the Iberian Peninsula now, it, it's riches and farms and it's all in the hands of the Visigoths, so there is probably some some improvement and the, the Visigothic Kingdom really has this capacity, right? They, they're still in unstable systems, right? They, it's difficult to talk of states here, there is, it's all very primitive um, in some way, but um, and it can always change, but still it's the best, uh, best horse to bet on. Um, so what happens though, and, and this is kind of moving in some ways, that in four, four, uh, 506 at Agde, so 506 as we've seen is the um, dawn of, of the fall of the Visigothic domination in Aquitaine at the end of the Franks, right? In Septimania, so this tribe that will be maintained by the Goths eventually, even after the collapse uh, in Gaul, there is this crowded synod of Catholic bishops in order to regulate the um, liturgical, hierarchical, moral, um, and patrimonial functionment of the ecclesiastical body that was the first Catholic synod that took place in Gaul under the protection and control of a Germanic king who was an Arian king and that in the opening protocol of the synod is called Piecimus the holiest, the most holy so this is uh, I don't know if you realize the magnitude of this statement right? we're talking about a population deeply Roman Catholic population that yet has decided to recognize a Germanic king, which is uh, Arian, as the, the holiest, as the authority under which the synod was taking place, right, under his protection, so that here you have, in spite of all the problems that, that, that the same Visigothic kingdom will have in this continuous struggle between Catholics and Arians. These guys in the Synod are most Catholic, they're not winking at Arianism. They aren't. But I still recognize that for a civil reason, for the survival of their own church and all the people who work on those lands that that, that have a life that that, that 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 make this world work, it's necessary an alliance with the king. No matter if he's Arya, doesn't matter. The, the, the thing here that matters is that he has provided the stability that after effectively one century of Visigothic domination, these elites have the full trust of one another. And this is really a great work of civilization, an enormous success. And, and we could extend this very further today, but we don't have time. The video is already pretty long the way it is, but we will see, even in law, the Eurasian code, for example, the, uh, also the Breviarium uh, Alarici, uh, right, and all the deep Romano-Germanic cooperation that have taken place at this point. So much that the Visigothic king, Kingdom could be seen as more a Roman one, indeed, than a Germanic one at this point, in terms of political and social composition. We're really talking about it. And these Germanic kings emanate laws that are essentially the Roman law combined with some Germanic one, but overwhelmingly like Roman, because also the Germans have become part of that system. They need those same Roman laws to, to make contracts work, to make transactions, to meet... Um, so, yeah, and I think this is pretty, pretty meaningful, and I'm very happy today to have made this video, because I believe that it's a chapter that is forgotten, and you know why, because it's not that Aquitaine ever had eventually a kind of, um, of a protagonist on its own, it's, it's remained this land that we know, yeah, that eventually began to gravitate from now, in fact, 
in, around um, the Franks, not the Visigoths anymore. But that, as we have seen, will retain its own identity, its own character, its own civilization, its own culture, right? But this is an advanced culture. It's a culture of elites that will keep reinforcing their own their own status in this world and will have their own identity, their own specific um, vision and contribution to, to Western civilization. So that we don't have a counter of Aquitaine today anymore, like we have of, of France and of Spain for, for different stories that these countries had. But always be, uh, always be aware that as Europeans, we come from this uh, composite background that we do have in spite of the necessities I think of modernity the necessity of of a of a statile unity of uh, that that facilitates cooperation union um, in in spirit of ours is we also come from all of these other spirits that were um, all together contributing to what we are now. Alright, so I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.